Uh, since I'm a firm believer the United States government can only do one thing at a time, uh, that I would just say uh, Iran, Iran, Iran. Stop the nuke. Uh, as much as I would like the United States more involved on other issues, I just don't think it can do these things uh, simultaneously. We just can't go there. Uh, so I would put all the emphasis on stopping the nuke. I would take, uh, I agree with the President, uh, that, the, uh, that the nuclear weapon in Khamenei and the Revolutionary Guard's hands is simply unacceptable, uh, that it is a surreal world that after 9-11 we would allow the uh, leading state sponsor of terrorism to have a nuke, uh, and I would do what is necessary uh, to stop it. If uh, one wants to go back to the notion of grand bargain, uh, I have no problem with that. Go ahead, try it. Uh, I'm quite confident that Khamenei will, will say no, but uh, if it makes uh, people more comfortable with uh, then going to a military option, uh, that's fine. I just suggest that most of the people who go in that direction, who want to have this sort of negotiated grand settlement, are quite willing basically to give up the shop before they even start because they're prepared to accept Khamenei having a nuke in the first place. Uh, so the negotiations are not perhaps uh, all that telling, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to going to them and saying, all right, you know, these are all the goodies you're going to get, but you're going to have to verifiably give up the nuclear program. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have, uh, as you can see, we have microphones, one set up there and one set up there. If you just queue, if you have a question to ask, we have about 25 minutes for questions. If you'd like to direct your question to a specific individual on the panel, please designate that individual when asking your question. And try to please, let's stick to one question per person. Thank you. Um, Mr. Gerecht, uh, this is for you. It is possible that we can uh, forestall uh, Iranian nuclear breakout, and that helps uh, Iran to perpetuate its tale that it has no interest in acquiring nuclear weapons. It's been saying that for a long time. He can say it over and over and over again. There's one thing that it would allow Iran to break out of its own promise uh, to not create nuclear weapons, something that Khomeini himself believed in, and that's to attack. If we attack, that gives them the excuse to wipe out you know, 20 years of promises that they're not going to develop nuclear weapons, because now we've provided an excuse. I think the only way out of this is to declare right now and clearly that the application of any nuclear weapon by Iran or by one of its uh, associates will result in the destruction of the holy city of Qom, followed by the, the destruction of Tehran. Make it clear that that is the price if ever an Iranian nuclear weapon is used. Give them 24 hours to evacuate their civilians, and then those cities are going up in smoke. Okay. Let's, and you can comment if you like, but let's try to stick to questions for this panel instead of um, policy positions. Thanks, though. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I don't believe in MAD. I, I don't believe in, I, I, I don't think it made it, it was terribly critical, credible by the end of the Cold War, and it's particularly not credible with the Middle East. The United States is not going to slaughter hundreds of thousands of innocent Iranians. It just ain't going to happen. So uh, I don't think that threatening uh, the use of nuclear weapons against cities has, uh, is, is, is a terribly good idea or an effective one. Now, let me make a point. It's not that we're not doing anything. What do you think all these cyber attacks and all this stuff going on? I mean, a lot of it's classified, but it's not like we're just sitting there doing nothing. And in fact, we're making them, you know, pay a price. And the idea that sanctions aren't working, look at the value of their currency. Look at all the problems they're having. I mean, this is ridiculous. Are they perfect? No. But they are better, stronger than we've ever had against any other country. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Ahmed Dean Ahmed from the Minaret of Freedom Institute. My question is directed to Mr. Gorecht, but I would welcome comments by anybody else on the panel. <clears throat> uh, Regarding the possibility of negotiating, you said that uh, you didn't think Khamenei would ever give up the nuclear program, but Khamenei is on the record as saying that his intention is the nuclear program not go to a nuclear weapon, but defends the right of Iran to have nuclear medical uh, uh, material as they're entitled to under the non-proliferation treaty. So my question is, uh, what do you think about simply publicly 
and offering them an exchange where the United States defends their right to have nuclear material in exchange for their giving complete access to the IAEA to do the inspections that maintain that they will follow through on Khamenei's promise not to develop a nuclear weapon. Uh, I have no problem with the Iranians living by the non-proliferation treaty, which they signed and they maintain they uh, want to abide by. Now, they've not been in conformance with that treaty. Uh, so the IAE, IAEA is the best uh, judge of that. Now, on Khamenei, I, I hate to break this to you, but uh, Khamenei fibs. Uh, there are many, many things he has fibbed about. Uh, this is simply one other thing that uh, uh, he, he has, uh, has not told the truth over. Uh, so uh, the one reason they haven't let us into Parchin is because I'm willing to bet large quantities of money is because they have actually been working on triggering devices and other such things. Uh, uh, Tony Cordesman did a wonderful 19-page assessment of where the Iranian nuclear program really is, how central it is to the overall defense strategy uh, uh, of the Islamic Republic. Uh, I think it's quite clear uh, that they have been uh, gunning for a weapon. Uh, the only thing I would suggest to you is that, uh, certainly having come from my from, from Langley, for God's sakes, do not depend upon CIA intelligence to tell you uh, when they are making a nuclear trigger, uh, they will fail. The agency uh, failed with Russia, it failed with China, it failed with India, it failed with Pakistan, and it failed with North Korea. Uh, that should be an impressive track record. Okay. Let's go to our next uh, question over here, maybe something non-Iran. Thank you, Paulette Lee, communications consultant. This question is for any or all members of the panel, and thank you for your presentations. To what extent is our current policy vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East driven by an Israel-first approach, and to what extent should it be? Thank you. Well, let some of the other people haven't gotten in. Ellen, why don't you? <laughs> I'll be happy to do it. Uh, I don't think it is driven by Israel only. I think that we obviously have very diverse interests in the region. And the discussion that both Larry and, uh, and Raul have gotten into on the triangle between the U.S., Iran, and Israel suggests that, in fact, you know, this administration has, I think, demonstrated over the last six months that while the security of Israel is a very high-ranking American priority, we should not assume that U.S. and Israeli interests are identical uh, with respect to Iran and, and perhaps even with respect to democratization in the Arab world. So I don't think it is, and I don't think it should be. Okay. I think I'm going to go again to this side because you've been in the queue longer. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Boaz Monroe from the Elliott School and uh, interning now at the State Department. Um, at the risk of leaving out the other panelists, I have a question for Mr. Gerecht again. Um, I was wondering where exactly our red lines with regard to Iranian nuclear enrichment should be and what the response should be if and when that red line is crossed. Uh, well, I, I would have said the red line should have been at 20 percent enrichment. Uh, but since they've already crossed that, it's a, it's a bit difficult. I would, I, would, I would use as a red line uh, simply the amount of 20 percent that would be necessary to make one bomb. And when they, that, that red line is approaching very rapidly. Uh, and when they, if they were to cross that, then I would attack them. Okay. Thank you. What's let me just add that I, I've spent a long time, a lot of time the last two years working on this issue, um, most recently at a senior working group we have at, uh, at USIP. And I've heard a lot of presentations on the military option, and all of them, uh, with a few exceptions, suggest how difficult it will be to prevail militarily. Um, the, the, the best experts suggest a war that will last weeks, if not longer. Um, there is one argument for a, a short strike overnight, clandestine, whatever that means in the region, um, that would sort of get the Iranian attention. 
but that doesn't get much support. So, you know, we have the kind of Woody Allen challenge when it comes to Iran between the horrible and the terrible. You know, we have very bad options, but I have not seen a persuasive argument from people who know a lot more about this. And I'm speaking, by the way, people from both the Republican and the Democratic right. parties who argue that the military option is an obvious and safe bet, or that increasing sanctions will compel the Iranians to cry uncle and do what we, what we want. So uh, while I recognize that diplomacy has a lot of sh uh, shortcomings, I'm far from convinced that the, uh, the, the obvious solution to prevent Iran from moving ahead in its nuclear program is to engage in a war with Iran. You know, there was a Bill Lewers and uh, Steve, I find so up from, uh, were up on the hill, and they said, you can't use the word diplomatic solution because that sounds weak, so call it a political solution. Okay. But, you know, it's interesting. I remember the Bush administration said, we will not let North Korea get a nuclear weapon. Okay, they got it. Has the world ended? Did we do anything? So you've got to be very careful about drawing these red lines because American credibility is online. If you make a statement and then you don't back it up because you decide that the costs are not worth it, you're going to pay a price uh, there as well. Yeah, and I think you also have to assume the Iranians are pretty aware of what our capabilities are now, too. It's not like you draw a red line and you're hiding a card that, you know, we haven't played already at some level. Okay, next. Uh, Rebecca Hopkins. I'm with uh, Courage Services, and this question is for Ms. Lapson. I'm interested in hearing more uh, about your discussion of the possibility of marrying U.S. institutional capacity with Gulf funding, areas where it might be best targeted or that type of thing. 